You guys, I've really missed you all. It's been a long time. And uh, since we uh, started putting this evening together, a lot of you have been expressing how much you've missed Easy Speak community. So I'm really, I'm really glad um, that, that we're here tonight. And uh, I'm hoping that we can get this going on a regular basis. I'm pretty sure we will, although there's some discussion still to be done. Um, <clears throat> And so anyway, thank you so much for coming. And uh, the the catalyst for getting this done tonight is Paul Nelson and T. Whitehall, and uh, just making sure it happened. <coughs> and, um, Mark Johnson and T. Clear have gotten on board, and they dragged me out of my lethargy. And I, and uh, just despite my worst inclinations i've fallen back in love with easy speak and well i never fell out of love with easy speak i've fallen back in love with doing things and so here we are and so thanks to paul and t and mark for making this happen uh we got we got a lot to do tonight and we want to keep this to two hours so <coughs> we're going to have huh? music interludes and meditation we're going to have an open mic uh T. Whitehall is going to be our feature performer. Ideal, Teresa Whitehall. And we're going to do more open night mic. So it's going to approximately follow the the Easy Speak template that we're used to. But um, we're putting a limit on the sign up list, and we're putting a pretty strict limit on a performance. Oh, hey. You guys need to either not talk or mute your mic. <laughs> okay, Peter, why don't you unmute yourself? And I muted everybody. And okay, good. All right. So, um, uh, poets and prose writers, please do one page. Um, uh, try to come in under three minutes. Uh, it, you know, minimize your introductions and comments because what we really want to do is fit as many people into the open mic part of things as we can. Um, Mark, get your cowbell ready for a demonstration. When we hit the three minute mark, um, Mark is going to do this. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, unmute. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a cowbell. Your background is scary, Mark, and, you're, and it ate your cowbell, but the sound came through just fine. <laughs> okay, so then uh, the I don't I do not know the order of the open mic. It's double super secret. We we really want to get through at least twenty of us. And if you guys do your best to keep it under that three minutes, hopefully we'll get through more. And so that. That's all I've got to say. I'm going to just sit back and relax. Paul Nelson's going to run the show. Mark Mark Johnson's going to be um, uh, helping oh, the show. And I believe T. Clear is going to be thinking evil thoughts all the way through. Far out, Peter. <clears throat> um, huge thanks to you for starting Easy Speak. Uh, I think it would be about seven years now that Easy Speak has been going on. So, uh, <laughs> A little hiatus from in-person uh, events uh, hasn't stopped us from doing it tonight, and uh, we'll see about doing it in the future because there seems to be very uh, a, a good good deal of enthusiasm about uh, doing Easy Speak via Zoom until we can meet again, which hopefully uh, will be soon, and uh, we'll be rid of what my eight-year-old daughter calls the the nasty virus. I hate the virus, this virus, she says. So um, we're going to get to as many as, of the open micers as we can. Teresa Whitehill is here from Ukiah, California. Well, she's actually in Ukiah, but she's here on our Zoom and would have been our, uh, our guest tonight in Wedgwood. So uh, we're going to make that happen anyway, which is a beautiful thing. And uh, one of our traditions at Easy Speak is they have the 52nd Street Band uh, every other easy speak and uh, kind of hard to get five people to coordinate the timing on zoom with all the weird zoom connection stuff that happens but we do have the leader of the band here and uh, the man probably most responsible for us all being here tonight because of his uh, efforts with the north end forum from which easy speak uh, split off so please welcome our friend jed myers to regale us with a tune jed unmute yourself please 
Hi. Hi, everybody. This is wonderful. The continuation of the spirit through changes in our reality is the thing. Here's a Tom Waits song. I fell into the ocean. You became my wife. I risked it all to save the sea and have a better life. Marie, you are the wild blue sky and men do foolish things. You turn kings into beggars and beggars into kings. Pretend you owe me nothing and all the world is green. We can bring back the old days again when all the world is green. The face forgives the mirror, the worm forgives the plow. The questions beg the answer. Can you forgive me somehow? Maybe when our story's over, we'll go where it's always spring. The band is playing our song again. No, the world is green. Pretend me nothing and all the world is green we can bring back the old days again when all the world is green moon is yellow silver Oh, the things that summer brings. It's a love you'd kill for. And all the world is green. He's balancing a diamond on a blade of grass. The dew will settle on our graves. And all the world is green. Pretend you owe me nothing and all the world is green. We can bring back the old days again and all the world is green. Let the Zoom recording note the number of golden hands that went up after you finished, Jen. Thank you so much. Jen will be back to kick off the second half. We're going to have a break tonight between our halves. Uh, 48 people are in the house. It's a pretty good house for easy speak. Uh, this event is made possible in part by poets and writers. They have helped out with a grant to our featured poets. So they made it possible uh, for her to get paid for her work and pay the poets was the chant at the Taos Poetry Circus for many years, and I'm down with that, absolutely. Um, we have at least 26 people on the open mic. The first three are gonna be Dennis Streeter, Ajax Smith, and Mary Crane. And then after that, it'll be Chris Buckley and Erica Michael and Ken Wade. So um, be ready for your time when you're up, and uh, please don't get cowbelled. We didn't want to make that a verb, and we don't have to make it a verb. Um, so uh, we, we don't want you to get cowbelled by our cowbell in chief, who tonight is uh, is Mark Johnson. So with that said, it's tradition. You know, it at Easy Speak, uh, when we had the list and we went straight from the list, Dennis Streeter would usually sign up first and read first. And, and so we thought we would uh, stick with the script. So Dennis, give us three minutes of your best. 
Well, I was unemployed at the end of March, so you might recognize this sort of thing. Tell me about yourself. I was born in, you don't need to know that. I've lived in Seattle area all my life, except from age five to eight, when I lived in Maryland, where I remember the FBI building, the Smithsonian, the fireflies and crane mantis, crawling through drawers built into the house, exploring all the passageways where Playboy magazines were hidden by previous owners. My first job was yard work and cleaning for Mrs. Bulletin. She was cheap, 50 cents for two hours. She was an odd one. There were Playboy magazines on her tables, said they were for her son when she visited. She was an odd one. The strangest thing I did was air out newspapers each day, one sheet at a time, put it back together again in the same order. There were other jobs as a kid, mowing yards and delivering papers. My first real job was bussing tables at the Royal Fort Buffet. I was 16. The manager would go next door to Goldie's and get drunk come back and lock himself in the office. He came out one time when I was going too slow, quickly showed me how to bust tables, tottered and slipped on the way to the dishwasher, turned red, looked, locked himself in the office, he left the next day. Then there was Frederick and Nelson. I was dishwasher for 10 years, volunteered at the Secret Garden Children's Bookshop through college graduated with a degree in, uh, in math and a minor in PE. Did, did various temp jobs for a year and a half. Strangest was straining wood chips from coffee beans and sorting by color at a Starbucks warehouse. I liked that, but maybe it was the caffeine oil soiling through my fingertips. Finally, there is the university bookstore. I sold student and art supplies to thousands of college students for 29 years. I was good at my job, always liked working with students. And then the plague laid me off, end of March. Months later, I'm still discovering what I tell you about myself. Thanks. All right, Dennis. Good to hear you again, man. Thanks for being here. Of course. Ajax is next. Hopefully he brought his harp. We'll see what happens. Alex, you're going to have to mute, unmute yourself and fire away. Okay, got it. Uh, I've been writing a lot uh, in this quarantine, a lot of poetry, a lot of stuff, but uh, also writing silly songs. So I'm going to grace you with some, a couple of the, uh, of my, Silly song. So this is the uh, first one is from uh, the Sound of Music uh, modified to uh, the summer of 2020, and it's called My Least Favorite Things. A frigid white winter that melts into gray. One endless more hearts that morphs into May. June brings sad stats of mortality swings. These are a few of my favorite th least favorite things. Wiping the doorknobs and washing our hands, putting the face masks and adjusting the bands. I'm sick of this washing, these awful mood swings. These are a few of my least favorite things. When the phone rings, when the Zoom calls, when I'm feeling stressed, I simply turn on my CNN news and then I feel so depressed. Chokeholds and COVID and face recognition, cameras and handcuffs and coughing forbidden, black and brown peoples tied up with strings. These are a few of my least favorite things. We turn on the news and the pundits inform, get ready, this bullshit's the awful new norm. I'm sick of this washing, these awful mood swings. These are a few of my least favorite things. When the sun shines, when it's game time, when I, I long for crowds, I simply remember my weak quarantine, and then I feel so let down. 
and a little mask song for the masks. <laughs> It don't work if you don't wear it. It don't work if you don't pull it up. Cover your mouth, cover your nose. Cause it don't work if you don't wear it. It don't work if you don't wear it. It don't work if you don't pull it up. Cause if you got the Rona, you don't wanna share it. That says the best part of wearing a mask is taking the freaking thing off. The best part of wearing a mask is taking the freaking thing off. But it don't work if you don't wear it. So put the damn thing on. I'm back, baby. But I thought you were over, but it was just the it was just a Zoom hiccup. <laughs> nice work, Ajax. Uh, I have an American sentence for you. Sign on 101 North of Hama Hama said, "Mask it or casket." <laughs> All right. Who is next on our parade of hits? The next three are going to be Mary Crane, Chris Buckley, Erica Michael, then after that, Ken Wade and Jed Myers. And right now it's live from Duval, Mary Crane. Mary, please unmute yourself and give us three minutes of your best. Hi, everybody. It is really wonderful to see all your faces. The poem I'm going to read, it's short, I will not exceed my three minutes, and I believe it's the first poem I wrote into the pandemic back in March. It's called In the Dark Hour. Should I write a poem when the full moon fills up the night with the voices of others, trills and whistles, croaks, howls, and hoots? In the morning, blackbirds call to their lovers across the continent. We bolt the doors, hiding from friends, neighbors, and a virus which gnaws on the bones of the civilized. We're tossed and fevered by a bare fragment of life. The sun shines through a quiet, pristine sky, while a cold night mocks our solace in cultivation. We think we'll survive, hedging our bets on this roll of the dice, be it Einstein, Whitman, or God. We're waiting for science to save us instead of that last call of the dark just before dawn. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mary. The pristine sky, indeed. The sky has been the subject of a couple of open mics that I've visited. And blessed are the sky watchers, I say. Thank you. It's good to see you. And I'm glad you wore your green. So we people are thinking of Ireland and your trip that hopefully will happen in the near future, your poetry retreat. OK. Next up, please welcome Chris Buckley. Thank Chris, you. unmute yourself. Are you there? I sure am. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good to see you. Excellent. Likewise. I've missed you all so much. <laughs> this time is really an important time for me, so I'm glad we got it back on the schedule, at least for one special night. This is, in fact, the very last thing I wrote for quarantine. I've had the opposite problem of uh, Ajax. That's just sort of shut down. There's just no time for poems to grow anymore. Uh, I'm looking forward to that changing at some point. I wrote this uh, right after our last Easy Speak in person, in fact, and I've sent a link to it here. Uh, it got picked up, so if anybody wants to download it for free, it's on page 75 of this PDF. Uh, just a word, it started out as a, an olfactory poem. I went around collecting scents for uh, about 24 hours. Couldn't make too much of it until COVID hit and this whole interaction between smell and difficulty breathing kind of brought it together. So I call it self-quarantined. The good news is we're all sick. Your scent and scentless rain, incurable obstacles to cut off on the way to Bartell or the bus. 
Morning Biker spreads a county fair petrichor. In the way, virally entangled, alfalfa and manure spring round up on the ranch. We are in respiratory distress. Work from home, wash your hands. Ferment steeps through Pike Place market bricks. Particles arrayed like a halo or crown. I am your face, don't touch me. The boy skunks of peanut butter and pot. Enveloped virus, old man smell, dog and sweated wool. I am medicated, a tang of forbidden grapefruit. I am vulnerable, isolate me. Fish in a midnight dumpster off Northeast 75th. I translate into protein in your host cells, a positive sense, single-stranded RNA strain in the absence of wine, lavender, and ammonia. Your mantle entwined in form line design, Our Lady of Seattle, undoer of knots, denature me, the smell of burning wax. I am a lingering cough, cover me. May I never be far from my people, a hearty crock of onion and cumin chili. Let them never claim me as their own. For we are not well and have been infectious all along. Thank you. Nicely done, Christopher. Good to hear your work again, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I wonder about the Pike Place Market myself. Um, our next few readers are Erica, Michael, Ken, Wade, Jed Myers, Lisa Fuchs, Kraus, and T. Clear. And so let's welcome Erica Michael. Erica, please unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here. My poem is called Entanglement, which refers to a, a, a theory in, con, in quantum physics that uh, uh, posits that uh, when that any particle of uh, matter in the universe can uh, influence any other particle of matter or energy in the universe, no matter how far in the cosmos apart that they are, or something like that. So the poem title is titled Entanglement. This plague, not a new thing. There's that old air, ring around a rosies, what the kids sing. Relic of some passe playbook. Look, there's the two of us, crucial stuff. You departed, poof. But it's the tis of thee, can't get enough of that spooky action from afar. My song caught in your harmonic strings. Don't know exactly where you are. I strum bare maple branches in the mist over the sound and I know that you receive me. Whistle wisps of cloud above the bank at daybreak. You receive me. That crow pecking at a crumb, the eagle sentry of a shrouded bow, his white head pivots. I know you receive me. Daffodils arc to the light, collecting cosmic bits beside a pond, and there you are, a boat with mirror image and a trail of wake. I'll be awake a while. A rainbow vapor as fog thins. I'm quantum spin and cosmic shift. Entanglement's my game. My interactions drift in the debris of that big bang background noise. You get the riff. You spin clockwise, I spin counterclockwise. Novel hit, gone viral. These Corona blues playing find the hidden kitty bop and waiting for a signal from that cosmic whistle stop. Beautiful, Erica. Wonderful. Thank you. Nice to hear your work. I love the research that you put into the work. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, Ken Wade, your turn, man. Okay, uh, nice to be here. I miss this as well. 
We're gonna do two poems that they're short. Uh, I've had a lot of time to uh, do these. First one is Love in the Time of Coronavirus. Let's meet in the park, sit two meters apart, personal benches, interventions, binoculars, watch the crows and jays do their flybys. Look into your weary, worried, sullen eyes. We could hold opposite ends of a long, barky, twisted stick, wiggle it around, up and down, bring it to our lips, talk our gloom away, raise heads towards a few virus-killing rays. I'll bring hand sanitizer, you bring wipes, we'll clean up this mess, then meander over to Bartels, get tested. It will be the perfect date. And I will really try hard to not mansplain anything. <laughs> okay. I've been doing a lot of yard work uh, as well. So the next poem's called Ivy. I am in the middle of it between the poetry and the ivy. The hedges have been entangled. Slittering, speckled, snaky vines, a rat hole of copulating cobra masses, whirling Sufi dancers smothering lovers, uncontrollable huggers. And I wish she were mine. Of course she is, but in a different way than I wish. I've given her a name, Ivy. I dream of her every day. How she moves her greenish sheen, her thin leafy skin, swelt figure, stout and profound roots. She comes from good stock, the house of Slytherin, but I fear the wrath of a woman like Ivy. She may kill me in the end. Thank you. Thanks for not mansplaining, Ken. All right. <laughs> Have you ever mansplained here? In a, well, don't answer that. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me see here. Uh, next up is the guy who kicked us off with song. Please welcome back Jed Myers. Hi, everybody. Here's a poem with a difficult title, Breaths Through Which our storming slacks. It's a warm August night after a long rosy dusk. We're standing out back, arm in arm, facing south. The young one asleep in the house and Jupiter crests a roof line across the alley. A moat of borrowed solar light whirled the telescopes show roiling with storms one, a mouth wide enough to swallow the earth, a hand's width to the west, the bright round moon, mindless lifelong confidant, silvers the neighbor's roof. That great sphere is lacking the wind to whip up its own dust. So from here, these two shining bodies against the dark, along with the few stars visible, and for that matter, the hulks of our houses and silhouette foliage darker still than the sky. All together, the largest thing is a slow turning stillness. We sum up the storms, the countless erupting suns, the hurricane spawn of August. The blasts in Beirut and Bangalore we'll wince at news of at breakfast and holding each a hand on the small of the other's back, as we with our animal circuits almost grasp the distances holding us. We take as given the rare several breaths through which our incessant storming slacks. Yes, I know we are warring at every meridian, and in a house near here, a man's hand is a meteor teaching a kid a lesson in darkness. Take the moon, Jupiter, and the stars as unwitting grand jury. I will attest to the craters I've left in my love's hearts. Storms turn inside us. The atoms of nerve, knuckle, and blood cell whirl on past burning and burial. Forgiveness does circle in. Before we enter the house, we inhale last whiffs of distance for now. From out there, how tiny our wars. 
Nicely done, Jed. The hurricane spawn of August. You know, when you said that line, I immediately went to that map of the two hurricanes headed for Louisiana. Yeah. Simultaneous. Thanks, man. And thanks for all you've done to make this community happen. I'm very grateful. It's a beautiful human phenomenon. <laughs> Amen. May it continue. All yeah. right. Our next few readers, Lisa Fuchs, Kraus, and T. Clear, and Mark Johnson, and Donna James. So please welcome Lisa. Hi, all. It's so great to see you. Um, it was kind of ironic at the beginning of Saul, as much as it was hard to fathom. I thought, what a great opportunity to write about something. I mean, it's you know, it's earth shaking. So months later, I have two, and they're very short. So 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 much for so so much for my intents. First one's called Soft Clothes. This was a spring, we'd patterned in slippers, a sort of soft clothes apocalypse. We didn't mean to, but we grieved all our endings the same. The death of our busher, the white hairs that framed my face. Second one is called Shaken, Not Stirred. Open the door, let the Siamese cat out. Let me loose the scatter petals. Power stems from elsewhere, Clocks tick long enough to build insulated basements and lock down houses. We dream the hours in silent Cantonese, sharp twined, sharp timed, quiet, asking only for a little, a saucer for every teacup, spoon for every fork. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for doing this, and thanks all of you. You look comfy in the easy chair. Yeah, it was better when I had a cat in my lap. <laughs> well, maybe that'll happen again. All I right. Was you photo bomb you. Anyway, thank you. Next is the keeper of the list, T. Clear. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad that all of us, or many of us, are here tonight, and welcome to the people that are not Seattle people that uh, are here out of, out of state, out of country maybe even, it's wonderful. An advantage of Zoom. Um, I'm gonna read one short poem in keeping with the one page limit of tonight. I wrote it early in the pandemic, <clears throat> right now. Let us be grateful to line up for groceries while there still are onions and apples to fill a bag. Grateful for the soft cotton mask sewn from an old sheet white as fog. For friends separated by six feet of caution, let us be grateful to step into a street so quiet now, every car settled like an afternoon nap from which it can't quite arouse. The drowse of it, the not knowing how long or ever. But let's not talk about that because too much, too much, too much in the daily statistics amping up. Be grateful there's yet no need to say we didn't know how good we had it in those early days. Amen, T. Clear. Gratitude, a beautiful place to be. Thank you for that reminder. Thanks for all you did to help make this happen too. Very grateful. Next up is Mark Johnson, the cowbell in chief. Will he cowbell himself? <laughs> Hopefully with no one looking. Oh, and by the way, is that some kind of torture device behind you? Can you show us that? Um... <laughs> yeah, let's see. That's uh, that, I call that Mr. Fix It. That's a big wrench. See. Kind of see it I on see the wall it. there. Um, Hopefully you won't have to use that either. Yeah, Mr. Fixit uh, is uh, used for changing the track that a train is running on manually. All right, um, let me get the timer set. I got it, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, I have a piece I've uh, written this year. I was reading William Matthews um, and ran across one of those poems that just kind of spoke across the ages 
called Telegram from the Muse. And this is my uh, poem after that. It's called Email from the Muse. Hey, you're kicking out some awesome verse. You're unsubmittable, right? I know at least 30 journals that need to see your stuff. I say, blast them with all you've got, then chill. Download a little 39 Ellington maybe and check out Lexicon Valley. I'll send you a link. Slip on some headphones and jigsaw the endless sidewalk. Pale shade of cherry blossoms, boarded storefronts painted with a veneer of anti-dystopia. Little free libraries, little free pantries. Grab some takeout at that Korean place on the waterfront where the viaduct used to run. Don't forget you still need to finish your parents' taxes and plant that plum tomato. There's plenty of time to write. I'll be in touch when I'm back from the islands. Do nothing until you hear from me. <laughs> Love the Ellington touch. Thanks, Mark. Nicely done, man. Thanks for wielding that so far silent cowbell. People have been very good, and, and uh, I think they fear you. I think that's a testament to their respect for, for you and your cowbell your cowbell um, ferocity. All right, next up is Donna James. Thank you, Paul. What a sight. It's just amazing. Um, a brief uh, footnote about this poem. There's a kind of uh, antidepressant called an MAO inhibitor, um, which is also found in some Peruvian indigenous medicine. And the thing to know about it for this poem is that um, if you take any of this stuff, you have to be on a special diet because if you mix it with um, fermented foods, it can be lethal. Stocking up for the apocalypse. Top left shelf back of the fridge sits a brew I must toss. Before someone thinking iced tea takes a swig after a big bowl of four cheese pasta and a glass or two of wine and dies of a hypertensive crisis. I can't bring myself to do it. Peruvian medicine remains from indigenous ceremonies, discovered to hoard synaptic serotonin. I'll need desperately come November, should the electorate deliver my worst nightmare. Stronger stuff is stored in the cheese compartment in the door, left over from a cancer ravaged liver when narcotics had a legal right in the refrigerator. That jar I reserve for the ensuing civil war. Thanks. All right, an opt a note of optimism. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Good to see you tonight. Nice work. Um, let me see here. The open mic uh, coming up uh, in a couple of poets will be Philip Patton. We'll hear from Jody Dills and Lynn Miller, and then we'll have our feature. So, Teresa Whitehill, you'll be after Lynn Miller. I'll do an introduction uh, for you for that. And uh, I'm going to read a poem. It's, uh, it was written at the Community of Writers at Squaw Valley, which I attended via Zoom uh, a couple of months ago. And it was written after uh, Bob Hass. Poem for Thursday evening after Bob Hass. This day has been clear on the edge of Lake Washington with the cascade so visible we see the snow has gone till November. It's shelter in place day 104 because it takes a Virgo to track these things and the days. Bob Hass, workshop day. So set the max pages to double space and hack away on retreat at my desk, still a little in awe of our pixelated world and how quickly it rooted, if such a word can apply here. It must be Thursday. And the way remnants of cottonwood fluff lodge in the spider webs just outside our condo window where resident hummingbirds hunt for spiders will not be there come coot season and the rain, 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 which seems like a romantic proposition on this too hot day. 79, I know, heat wimp, but we're not in Chicago anymore, despite the White Sox coronavirus mask Ma made with one of Pop's old Sox hats. The young men piloting the Love Canal 
unaware of the legendary toxic waste dump this yacht's not named after, drink away their Thursday evening at the helm while the ladies drink and smoke below. All this week's been about soul, whether we admit it or not. But then it's always about soul about building a soul or the pain of ignoring the soul's directives, which in my case, radiation will apparently solve. And Larry Dossie, a doctor himself tracking the non-local can pilot on to combat materialist dogma, but let's Donald D. Hoffman, cognitive scientist at UC Irvine, get in the last punch. The scientific study of consciousness is in the embarrassing position of having no scientific theory of consciousness. And so goes the soul in a culture that is the heir to Galileo. Only the Pope of the Church of Materialism is a reality TV show host who tested the Peter Principle with predictable results. And the soul plays on in dreams, in despised poems that veer from the doctrine of discourse, in tantric precision and the quality of one's authentic surrender. It is still too early this evening for the swallows or for the empirical method to begin to understand, even in a Chicago boy plunked down into nature, how the osprey fends off eagle, but gives Heron a pass to gulp down as many fish as he can. Somehow, the workings of soul building hinge on memorizing the wing beats of all the resident birds, learning how to earn the trust of rabbits and relearning how to breathe. Because for those who'd prefer to hunt among stones, for where the poem lies dormant, awaiting the lucky querent who somehow comes stumbling by, the elimination of personality will arrive in its own sweet time. All right, that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Next up is Philip Patton, followed by Jody Dills and Lynn Miller, and then our feature, Philip. I have unmuted. Okay, back in 88 and 89, I was on a salmon singer in southeast Alaska. This is dead humpies rotting in the bilge and the batteries stinking and the weather dirty and the antidote. I don't get seasick, just luck of the draw. But that time running south out of Chatham Straits in dirty weather and the skipper had me filling the batteries in the sweltering engine room and the smells of battery acid and leaking diesel fumes and hot oil and of the two dead humpies we those are salmon we later washed out of the bilge under the engine i was getting a bit lightheaded but then it was time to sack out up there with my head next to the knee that's the front of the boat in my forecastle lower bunk and the bow slamming up and down an easy 10 feet and i had started out queasy but we all know how to deal with these things just thinking about my then girlfriend lecherous male lizard brain even gets a hint of procreation even from cerebral cortex fantasies and it yells to that queasy stomach, priority, priority, go back to sleep. But you all, being Fisher persons, know how that is. Amorous thoughts quells queasiness. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. You're standing by with a meditation before our break, right? Standing. St sitting, sitting by. OK. <laughs> All right, that was Philip. And uh, now please welcome Jody Dills. Jody. Um, I, who signed me up? I didn't sign up. You want to read a poem? You know, I was kind of looking through some stuff, and I'm just so unprepared that I just, I don't, I'm just way too unprepared. But whoever signed me up, you know, thanks for thinking of me. I, <laughs> I, I can't. I mean, I'm looking at some things here, and I'm just like, nah, I that, just stumble that, over it. So that would be Monroe's fault, Jody. Oh, okay. Well, thanks, Peter. For yeah, I mean, I I I consider um, I consider it a nod. Thank you very much. <laughs> here you go. Okay, go here to you the go. next guy. 
Uh, okay, the next guy is Lynn Miller. <clears throat> the next lady, Lynn, you'll have to unmute yourself. And um, if you if you signed up, then it's your turn to read. Lynn, Lynn, are you? Do we lose Lynn? If you have to unmute, if you're still there, I've got to go through 47 people to try and find you, and I can't. So. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to go to our featured reader. Does that sound like a, a good thing to do? Yeah, it, it looks like she's off. It, all right, good. Thanks, co-host. All right. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to read the bio. Um, it's on the Easy Speak website. A California poet, letterpress printer, and graphic designer, Teresa Whitehill served as poet laureate for Ukiah, California in 2009 through 2011. She's been involved her entire career in the production of poetry readings and literary events, which earns huge poetry karma points. Her interrelated focus on literary and graphic arts came out of her study of book arts at Mills College in the early 80s. Since 1984, she's lived in Mendocino County, where she's well known to local poetry audiences. Evora Adossi. I hope I didn't mangle that. Her poem about Portuguese soul and food was published by Alice Waters. She served as poet in residence for Stag's Leap Winery in the Napa Valley, and her collections of poetry include A Grammar of Longing, 2009, and A Natural History of Mill Towns, 1993, published by Pygmy Forest Press, Saudades, published by Stag's Leap Winery in 2003. She's published in the anthology Deep Valley, Poets Laureate of Ukiah, 2001 to 2018. Uh, she spends her time between her studios in Ukiah and St. Helena, California, managing her commercial graphic design business, Colored Horse Studios. And I had a chance to meet her when I went down to interview Mary Norbert Cordy. That's going on two years ago. By the way, I talked to Mary uh, today, and she's got a little smoke at her place, but otherwise she seems to be in very good spirits. Um, we're talking to uh, Teresa, who's in the part of the world that has had, uh, in a state that's had more wildfires in a week than 15 years ago, they would have had in a very bad year of fire. So we're delightful that she's here. I had a chance to read at an open mic, and when she stepped up and started reading her work with such confidence and such grace, uh, it was incredibly compelling, and I thought we have to bring her to Seattle. So we have in a manner of speaking, but I hope that you'll actually get a chance to meet you all sometime in the flesh. So please welcome our featured reader tonight, made possible by poets and writers, Teresa Whitehill. Thank you, Paul. Um, glad to be here, uh, returning the favor. We're bringing a little bit of Mendocino County to uh, Seattle. So I'd just like to say that I'm reading tonight from my studio in Ukiah in Mendocino County, and it's land that is homeland to the Northern Homo. What time it is? I don't know what time it is. I'm driving through the south end of town. I've forgotten my watch. I've forgotten every watch, and my windshield flicks the angina signal. Clench, release, scrape, back. I don't know what time it is or whether I was late hours ago. And the man in the gray striped suit who has gone from being president to being newspaper photo dots is now dispersing off the yellowed sheets. Up ahead through the traffic, I can see one of those hearses crossing Main Street with its load of logs from a grove that has only recently been declared sacred. I don't know what time it is or where I was supposed to be. This morning, my high school son didn't come home from his state and the roof leaks bold drops into the garage. And my father's hunting knife, I don't know whether it's still human blood on the blade or that's been canceled by his old ritual of cleaning the gun towards himself. The election isn't far off, the trees aren't waiting. They're going faster like lemmings over the cliff. They load like pancakes. My truck almost skids from how easy they take. Uh, 
here's a little poem. Um, it's uh, dedicated to Gordy Adams, a postal delivery carrier in St. Helena, California. It also goes out to all the US mail carriers at this time. Gordy. Gordy, famous mailman. What tenderness comes into the voices of people who speak of him in his absence? What is it he does that has granted him such large acreage in the hearts of this community? Quick, tell me. I'll imitate him. I will carry sacks of mail. I will know everyone on my route. I will row a goatee. Divide my face between rose and blue. I promise I will never hesitate again in front of decisions that will change my life, that will give me wrinkles, making of me a work of art, an act of will to be utterly invested in the way words travel in this late shadow of the 20th century. Surely this is the most three-dimensional of portraits, for it will become itself a small pack of words which folds up and licks itself shut and seals. Of all habits, he will be the one hardest for St. Helena to break. A good candidate for that most well-meaning and misguided bionic reproduction. Uh, chocolate, chocolate is a guitar. Uh, this is dedicated to the nurses of Kaiser's Infusion Center in Santa Rosa, California, because of a sign that they had over their nursing station that said, because without chocolate, all would be darkness and chaos. Chocolate is a guitar. Chocolate is a guitar that plays the details of the mountain which lies under the skin of our laughter, inviting blossoms, but made of shadow, a nightscape unrelieved by stars. When chocolate was a controlled substance in Europe, it was a guitar and a shoe, a beautiful pair of slippers that could bring you to the door of your beloved. And how wise were the Catholic fathers to be so wary knowing the Aztecs respected it as a god, a powerful ally, one of the primary forces, a natural resource like lightning. We put it into our mouths so casually, our fingers pluck at the easy strings which pull from our bellies mad resonances. Played in the simple chord progressions of sugar, cacao is a delight an olfactory time portal, something which races under the skin and into the blood with manic joy, tender closer to the appetite, shutting the door on the meal, opening the door of the night, great mimic of the behavior of the heart enthralled. On such a night, cacao in an impeccably crafted wood of deep nutty brown, stands in perfect contrast to a garden splayed out under the fist of the moon, a garden cast in silvers and whites, the negative hype of the soul. We hear the rippling laughter of its strings because of course, compared with everything else, it is a complete food. Something that would have frightened the prophet in the desert with his fanciful fast. We know now what the Dark One offered to the young man Jesus, do we not? Compared to its sleek and elegant phrasing, everything else is pale. The white foods, the bone foods, the silvery table service, and the moon eavesdropping on our secret appetites. Played in the lower registers, in the minor keys of spice, pepper, and flesh, it more closely resembles the illicit drug of the 16th century Parisian, a cargo for fateful 
sailing ships, the eyeshadow of women for whom life and love are multiple and the landscape a skirt to the sky. Fermentation is its baptism and it is married off to fermented corn silk, Quitlacoche, in the mountains of Sonora, an accompaniment to the distillation of nuts and herbs in Alta California, inserted into dreams and fictions, a charge of power, a mess, a mountain. And if a mountain is powerful, then a mountain is a shoe and a guitar. Sturdy athletic shoes which tack lightly across the ragged volcanic detritus. Trick guitar that wails with the soul of an owl. Complex of nerves and of fault lines. A mole. Um, California, California Milagro. Uh, this is dedicated to my friend Shannon Hughes of Port Townsend um, for her imagi imagination, inspiration, and magic. This poem is part of a project that we created together. California Milagro. By the fig and by the olive. Thus begins a prayer from the Quran. It goes on to praise the closest mountaintop, in this case, a saw-toothed ridge rearing back so slowly, we walk its precipitous edge, blinking, and are gone. By the fig and by the olive, Surat Atim. And under the ragged rocks, we imagine angels in the stone faces so that we can look at them without blushing. We fashion wings for them out of manzanita and pennyroyal so that we can enter their arms, the arms of the mountain with complete abandon. We invoke the olive and the fig. We wake in the middle of the night looking through the window to the next world, lit from inside the throat of the coyote, a world that intersects ours only in the shadow of stone pillars, in the splash of a fountain in the water we take so carelessly into our throats. And this, this is the picnic. The trail that brings you up the mountain will bring you down again. And if you let it, if you have the appetite or know where to find it, it can lead you to other paths that intersect alleys musical with gravel and the back doors of jazz clubs. Formal roads paved with the guts of prehistoric lovers. These surfaces can take you all the way to the town of Whitehorse in the Klondike region near the border of Canada and Alaska, and all the way back again to Isla Santa Inez in the Chilean Tierra del Fuego, past the city where people sleep on beds of salt, past the milagros of the skyline, the chapels of commerce. This is your picnic blanket, your Americas. You can take it up, gingerly lifting each corner of the tattered twin continent. Newfoundland, Argentina, the Aleutian Islands, shaking out the crumbles, then flicking it out, poof, and laying it back down again. It looks like an old favorite t-shirt, long since spattered with battery acid. Now it becomes a beloved quilt on which to dream, a stage over which creatures rove and stumble and flatten themselves into tar pits, where 30,000 years ago, lovers who wore amulets of bone and shell settle along waterways, harvesting the fertility of stars, where airplanes hover and buzz, bestowing and removing <coughs> fragmentary bits of consciousness. Clouds rise and falter and dissolve. Fires race back and forth. Rockets take off. Bombs explode. Mountains shift their weight from one hip to another. Dandelion flowers plump and swell and burst under the pressure of water and its claiming. From here, the banana shape of California 
is a perfect fit for the sleepy torso. And the artful depression that is the Napa Valley can be spanned by two fingers pressed against the ground in the classic symbol of peace. A place any Mediterranean refugee recognizes instantly and with appetite. It is a perfect mimicry of home. California is saudades. It is the tragic blood which underlies its colonial history. It is the miracle of memory reconstituted, a fertile soil and a climate of grace and ambition. It is transparent, adaptive alchemical. Surat Atim. Sutra, deep prayer of life. Diva of the rock music scene, bending over in her damp skirt with her fault zone visible. Politician of the industrial waterways, the Venice of the internet, spend your lonely buttons here. This is the domain of Queen Calafia, legendary ruler of a race of black women who thrived in a paradise that brought us the mystic John Muir, inspired the poetry of Black Bart, master thief and social critic. Prayer, deep sister of the soul, open up our appetites, place our hands under your skirt, let this picnic nourish, enhance the dream life. Prayer, deep prayer of tides, rancheria of sun-baked feet stamping the dust, O oh, thou enwrapped one, rise up a little, show me the rush hour traffic of the forgotten. Lend me your rhythm so that I can sing, and in singing, rise. Prayer, deep prayer of grotto and of delicious fruit. Order up for us this one rambunctious twilight so that we may continue through the evening. Then, and only then, take and feed on us if you must. But let us feel the buckling of the day under its load of blossoms, the margin of the soul etched, squandered. Let us feel the edges of things, of continents, the cool of the garden fragrant and its birth, and the eternal center, the heart of stone, the gift of time in its aspect, water. Teresa, what was the name of that? Um, that's called um, <laughs> that's called a brain lapse. <laughs> California Milagro. <laughs> okay, back to a little chocolate. I think um, this is, I have I think two more poems. Todos Santos. Plaza Sena, Santa Fe. In the mystery of a little shop, off a hidden courtyard, centuries old, succuous caramels are arranged on an antique tray and folded by painstakingly stitched lace, depicting skeletons riding gas-powered lawnmowers, as if tea time were every moment of arriving by plane and mystery brought to the point of melting sugar with a perfect facsimile of heartache. An enthrallment of the heart as a petal of time, delicate, unrestrained, topped with a sprinkling of pink salt and packaged in bolts of electric foil. Ribbons of edible icicles that double as a row of teeth next to a cabinet of edible and fluorescent yonis and prayers for healing. And as for the ministry of chocolate, what skull or joint of finger or perfectly plump penis elaborated with crystallized ginger could enter the dark hollow of our throats with such scholarship, such whimsy of rose water and chili? What rune coated in pure oil of cinnamon 
and cacao blossom could possibly divine how far and how fast we are now and always being flung at any moment through deepest space. So I will close with um, Asmar. Starts with a couple of quotes from uh, Night and Horses and the Desert, the anthology of classical Arabic literature. Thus saith Muhammad ibn Ashik al Nadim, the per first people to collect stories, devoting books to them and safeguarding them in libraries, some of them being written as though animals were speaking, were the early Persians. And this. Ibn al Nadim refers to fictions as evening stories, as mar, as one was not supposed to spend the daylight hours on such idle stuff. I am here to tell you such a story. It is night. We are here in Seattle. It is a time of dreams and fictions. There is much to say about the town and its planet, about our fragile hold on its crust, about the vast world of stars. And I speak to you under the cover of darkness because that has always been a time when things can be said that could not otherwise be unsaid. Eleven centuries have passed since Al-Nadim first wrote about devoting books to collecting stories. A car bomb explodes on Mutanabi Street in Baghdad. It is the spring of 2007. Mutanabi Street is the historic center of Baghdad's book selling, with bookstores and outdoor bookstalls, cafes, stationery shops, tea and tobacco shops, pretty much just like Pike Place here in Seattle. It is a mixed Shia Sunni area, named after the 10th century Iraqi poet Al Mutanabi. More than 30 people are killed and more than a hundred wounded. And the books burn. The area is destroyed. It takes a year and a half for the street to be reopened. The Souk al warakin or book dealers market in 10th century Baghdad contained 100 booksellers. It's exactly like Post Alley. Some of these shops doubled as literary salons and for example, even al Sam's bookstore provided a rendezvous for philosophers. Medieval book dealers often branched out into the manufacture of paper and the copying of manuscripts. So, these stories we tell each other, this culture of majlis, of soirees, at which poets and scholars strut and compete and tease each other with their wits and send words on wings to devour our souls. You must now imagine that it contains a silence inside of it that goes on for a year and a half. That's nearly 60 million heartbeats for each one of us. Imagine the musical composition that could encompass such a silence. Which is why I am here to tell you a story. It is night, a time of dreams and fictions. There is much to say about Pike Place and its planet, about our fragile foothold on this crust of earth, about the vast world of stars. We are in a garden. Your lover is nearby. She is wearing a cloak of dark purple. He is perched on a stone wall with lichen and he plays his guitar. Speak softly then, or you will disturb the heart of the night. Speak quietly from the balcony that overlooks the garden. Toss me 
your scarf because the moon is wounded. Walk softly on the balcony overlooking the gardens. Toss me your scarf because there has been an explosion and I am dead. The garden is gathering the dew in its throat. Speak tenderly on this balcony overlooking the flowers and the vegetables. Toss me your scarf. I am losing my soul. Fantastic. Please feel free to unmute yourself and applaud like. Teresa, that was masterful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, for setting this up. I love how you get into it standing up there. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, tell us about the fires. Are, 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 is your place threatened? What's, what's the air quality like? Tell us what's going on. Air quality is wretched. Um, the fires just took down some old growth redwoods in the Santa Cruz mountains. Uh, in addition, in that same area, it just burnt down a fine press publisher, Moving Parts Press. Good friend of mine, Felicia Rice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she, she has, she lost everything. She lost decades of fine press publishing, one of a kind pieces, huge yeah. cultural loss. Uh, fortunately, no one was hurt. Um, Everyone got evacuated from that particular place. Ukiah is not threatened. The, the main fire centers are south of here and east of here. Uh, one fire is, I think, about 50% contained. Another is only about 15% contained. So we're not out of the woods yet. Well, I'm glad you were here tonight. I'm glad that Easy Speak folks got a taste of uh, your mastery. And I'm really grateful to know you. That was really fantastic. You know, when you get your friend a reading, you really hope they deliver it. I knew you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, hang out. As um, Philip, uh, if you could give us uh, a bit of your magic for the meditation, we'd, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, I'll be happy to. And I have to so unmute. Good. He's, he's like that was so that far was above anyone we've heard of in this group, but glad I got to listen to her. <laughs> All right, Philip, I muted you, but if you can un unmute there, Philip, because I muted everybody, and then we'll be ready to go. Uh, Philip, just um, please unmute yourself, Philip. Okay. There we go. I, somehow I unmuted twice, but. Huh. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Excellent. Yeah. All right. After that poem, uh, not the last one that Teresa did, the one before that, I thought we really need a cigarette break. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have. We're gonna, I'm going to set the clock for uh, nine minutes, and um, and I'll be back in that time. So, so we got him. There's the cowbell. More cowbell, more cowbell, and uh, see you guys. Talk amongst yourself. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, to reason yourself. To reason we need chocolate now. <laughs> oh, I know. It's a chocolate break. Yeah, there was a little. Uh, there was a little chat going on about that. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, Teresa, you'll have to see uh, some of the some of the things that people were latching onto while you were uh, while you were reading. So yeah, now I've been browsing the the chat. It's pretty fun. It's fun. Yeah. 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 Nice work. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great to be introduced to a new a new poetry community. Yeah. And to see us trying to rise from the ashes ourselves. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, a lot going on in all parts of the world. Hmm. Uh, no one's no one's spared this year. No. Well, I don't want to know. Yeah, I'm down in Fairfax, California. So they're not threatened by fire, but the air is just hideous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, the wind um, mostly went south. So San Francisco and the whole South Peninsula, East Bay are all, just, it stinks. <laughs> it's really bad. Well, and I read in the paper today that the smoke from California is in Nebraska. Really? I believe it. Nice for it. <laughs> that's a lot of that's a lot of smoke. Pretty amazing. I well, lost fantastic, it. fantastic, just really brilliant. Yeah. Um, we'll have to go by the market when you're in town. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not going to be the same. I I don't know if I've been to the market since the lockdown, um, but. You know, there's, there's I have. Vendors. Have you? What's it look like? Oh, of course, you live right by there. Well, my favorite uh, vegetable stand uh, is is open. Hey, um, is that? But Sosa, Sosa's is open, but I think the fish market where they throw the fish is closed and then almost nothing open. So flowers and, you know, kind of things you'd expect. That, what about Tenzing yeah, Momo? Very, what's that? Do you know Tenzing, Tenzing Momo? Momo? It's the Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist herbal apothecary. Down near the, down at the end where the, the bend is. I don't, I don't know. I you, go, you go past the pig and around the corner and then it's all, it's in a corner there next to, I think it's the toy store. Um, it's a Tibetan Buddhist herbal apothecary, Tenzing Momo. Tenzing Momo, check yeah, it out. I live right down near there. It's a great place. Uh, the guy who founded it, Jeff Gould, when the Dalai Lama came to town, he said to his holiness, um, would you like to go down to the hot dog stand? Uh, and the Dalai Lama was like, why would I want to go there? He said, to ask him to make us one with everything. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's Jeff's sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. What How did he, he respond? I don't remember. I didn't get that part of the story. That was after the punchline. <laughs> you know, the Dalai Lama does eat meat, but I don't know that he eats hot dogs. <clears throat> because in, in uh, Tibet, it's hard to, to not eat meat because there's not a lot that grows up that high. We, um, to answer James uh, Mann's question, did anyone invite Kip? Um, no, we didn't, but we talked about um, getting a, a Wedgwood update at least and, and maybe having Kip do a cameo for next time. And yeah. so Kip he could be carrying a tray of drinks. You know, Kip, is on the, Kip is on the Easy Speak newsletter mailing list and he does open these. He knows about this. I think he's just blowing us off, that fucker. <laughs> Lazy bones. No tips, he's not going to show up. Yeah. yeah. I hope he's gotten an income. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. He liked our tips. Mm. He made good money on, on our nights, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, especially for him to yeah the the our our monday nights have been always um 
been good business for Wedgwood. That's a pretty dead night, and that's a pretty dead room on a Monday night. So they're happy. They're really happy, you know, in a business sense with what we've got going on back there. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be we'll be back there someday. If they're there. I remember if there's one, a bear there. I remember one poet who used to buy a dollar's fifties worth of of tea. Still great. And, and tip fifteen percent, which was twenty three cents. <laughs> Most of us are better than that. Ay ay ay. <clears throat> oh man. Well, some people have dropped out, so I'm going to add someone who asked to be part of this. Um, so, Seamus, you're coming up. We're going to get a song from Jed. Chris Beaver's coming up. Jane Merrick backed out. And uh, Ace, uh, if you're there, we'll put you in right after Chris. Ace, are you there? Uh, that was... Let me see. No, I don't think so. I think Ace left too, so we won't put him there. <laughs> all right. That's all right. Two minutes left. And our... it's interesting to toggle back and forth between all the uh, applications here. <laughs> it's that... nice to read off the computer, though. I really like that part. I was able to read off a PDF with large 14 point font, so that helps. Paul. Yes, sir. You need 14 point font? <laughs> Ouch. I do because I don't wear glasses. <laughs> I tried using reading glasses and it really helps, but then I'm afraid my eyes are going to be de dependent on them. So I, I fight it off. Uh but then I have to have real good light. The night light at bedtime is so-so. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, we've got about another minute here. So how it's gonna work is we're gonna have Jed do another tune and uh, we'll reconvene the open mic with Seamus and Chris and Tobin and El Schwartz and Christina and Emily. Carla Stein, uh, I checked in from Nanaimo. Carla, are you still? Oh, Jane, you're here. Oh, good. Excellent. I thought I saw a goodbye note from you. Can't hear you. Wait, wait. And uh, so, all right. So we'll have Jane. We'll be after Chris. That's fine. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, Carla, Carla's still here. Carla, do I? Can I see you there, Carla? I, yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Good. Good to see you. Yeah. How are you doing, Paul? Good. I'm glad you're here. Fantastic. It's been um, a great. Yeah. And uh, Michael Dylan Welch checked in on the chat, and you're going to be after Carla and before Peter Monroe. Michael, are you there? I'm here. Very, uh, in the sky. Very nicely done. <laughs> Very nicely done. All right, so um, <clears throat> Easy Speak Open Mic Part Two. That was my timer. Stop, stop. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so um, Jed Myers, uh, do you have another tune queued up for us to start oh. part two? Hello, everyone, again. It's and been really. Everybody's going to mute themselves and let you have uh, have the time, Jed. All right. I'm glad I get to sing another song for y'all. It's an old favorite. Corina on my mind Corina, 
coming up, coming up on my mind. Can't stop thinking about you, baby, and I just can't keep from crying. I got a bird to whistle, got a bird to sing. Got a bird to whistle, got a bird to sing. Dial my Camino. And I don't mean a thing. I love to love you for I knew your name. Yes, I would. I loved you before I knew your name. Oh, yeah, I run around on my honey. And I love you just the same. Corina, Corina, where you been so long? Corina, Corina, where you been so long? Can't stop thinking about you, honey. Won't you please come home? All right, Jed. Fantastic, man. You sound good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. You know, you worry about how it's going to sound on the computer. It sounds good. It's also nice to see your little library. It's also, it's nice to see everybody's library or sky or ship or political statement. Very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is great. This is turning out very nicely. I'm going to do, um, uh, we've got a couple of changes on the open mic. So um, some people have dropped out. Some people have dropped in. It's going to go Seamus and Chris and Jane Merrick and Lynn Ellis and Tobin Marsh and Al Schwartz and Christina Stapleton and Emily Wilson and Carla and Michael and then Peter Monroe will close us off. So Seamus, if you're there, unmute yourself and give us three minutes of your best. All right. Good. All right. Well, uh, this is called Call Me Life. Never thought it would come to this, the whole planet, turn to a little colony. While I'm listening to the ducks and geese that blow the creek, wonder how many songwriters figured out quarantine rhymes old teen and virus with iris. I played my great Henry Iris in the center of the third floor balcony. Now this sprout virus free and virus fighting. Out with my dartboard in the store closet door, sterilized after reach for a bullseye or no. My old Chinese friends came over and taught how to play three card liar poker. We gambled, beat boredom, and everyone won, though I understood the word. Time to wash these hands and scratch another notch in the wall of my recent dude. Stay home with the new film. Big stir keeps telling me I don't trust her or her brother. Mona Lisa wasn't a man. It's in groceries. A B old. This I understand. There you go. Thanks, Seamus. A little bit of uh, a little bit of a connection problem there for a bit. So I hope it didn't sound too bad for everyone. Okay. I was missing a little bit of it. I love your map. Great map back there map of yeah Pittsburgh. that's from that's from uh that's from what i don't know i had not in nanaimo yeah all right man chris beaver oh an easy speak regular chris and a popo participant chris it's your turn okay thanks paul 
Hi everyone, it is awesome to see you and hear you. Um, I'm gonna read a poem that I was lucky to have in the current issue of Bracken. August 1964. It was the summer neighborhood boys noticed breasts blossoming. Let me start over. It was the summer neighborhood boys noticed breasts blossoming like pale pink hydrangeas inside our blouses and hoped to unbutton the women in us. The summer the woods down the lane was jungly with thick blackberry vines that scratched our bare legs when the four of us in only tennis shoes and swimsuits, trekked to Clicker's Pond without the boys. We splashed and giggled in the murky water, emerged screaming at the sight of leeches freckled on each other. Just then, the boys who'd been tracking us appeared and volunteered to pluck off all the dark untouchables. When Andy found a bloodsucker clinging to my left breast, a pulse of tiny petals rippled to the top of my head. It was the first summer I bled and bloomed in the hand of a boy. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Published in Bracken, you say? Mm -hmm. Far out. Thanks for being here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're a popo person. All right, Jay Merrick from Port Townsend. Can you hear? From, from right behind uh, Red Pines House. That's right, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Uh, I wasn't sure the mic was working. Sounds great. Um, okay, this is titled Scored. Not in the same way as the poem <laughs> that she just read. Um, this is, I'm yearning to be outside as many of us are. Uh, and the only thing to know about this poem is that it starts with a long dependent phrase. Enjoying the tastes of the scents of wood, cypress, red cedar, Douglas fir, or young trees scored by the incisors of beavers who work persistently drawing their front teeth down, scrape after scrape, scattering crisp bright curls of wood and gouging the trees into hourglass shapes that will eventually topple. I am reminded how life selects some beings to be taken down for the benefit of others. Although damaged trees are able to sustain themselves for a while and may even recover from injuries if left to their devices if the initial damage is not extreme. One thinks of the convention of carving initials into an apple tree, such human presumption, or of wounds from an accident of lightning or a falling branch, or of bucks rubbing velvet from their antlers, the scarification lasting decades, growth being a ferocious driver of recovery as well as of damage. Perfumes waft from broken stems, perturbed earth. I do not feel such injuries all the time, although I am sure many of us are traveling through shadows and waiting for our flesh to heal over the red and purple abrasions and abscesses, real or figurative. We may imagine that trees are aware of the process of being ravaged, of feeling the intrusion of insect probes, filaments of fungi, woodpecker depredations with the forest, an analogy to the way we wonder about things, worry over things, finger the breaches in our surfaces and test on our tongues, the aromas released when inner selves are opened because we know those around us, like ourselves, may close up over many years, may in fact still topple, even if beginning to heal. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Nice work. Thank you, sir. Chief of the Rally Tree by Jennifer Boyden. I recommend it to you. Thank you.
for those who care about the secret life of trees. Nicely done. All right. Lynn Ellis, it's Hi. your turn. Hi. Hey. Um, so I wanted to extend the story um, that Teresa gave us about um, Felicia Rice and Moving Parts Press. Um, I was devastated, of course, to hear of her, the loss of her studio a couple of days ago. Um, and I checked in with her briefly um, and it sounds like they're gonna do a GoFundMe. Um, but um, in, the, in the meantime, um, the good news is, is that she still has a digital catalog. Um, there's Bo Beausoleil has a series and um, she also has a series of my uh, poems that uh, she is producing as broadsides um, available to download for free <laughs> on her website. Um, so here is one of them and I'm gonna see if the screen sharing works. And if you could put a link in the chat room when you get a chance, that'd be great. Sure. All right, so it's, um, this is for phase two. Let us bring it out of the air. Let us talk about hope as a heavy structure, the hull of a battleship or a forge or a planet. Let us bring it out of the air to the dry July ground. Fireworks go off for hours after sunset, cannon fire in a war against what? We talk about hope in the past tense. The life we've known is gone, the safety of touch gone. Our promised summer is lost to fever while collective denial strikes at the most vulnerable. Let us talk about hope as a teacher in an ignorant nation preparing her own preventable death. Let us feel the weight of that. Outside the Earth's cool shadow, there are no visible stars. Future space travelers will see only infinite flat black for months. As a firework, we like to think that hope is the explosion, is the light and color in warm air. I'm here to say that hope is the sulfur. It is the fuse. Thanks. Beautiful, then. Thank you for that poem and the multimedia effect. Nicely done. Far out. Um, but the sad news uh, about the press. And do put the link in the chat room. That would be helpful. Tobin Marsh, did you make it here tonight? I don't see your name in the T section. So I'm going to say you're not here and pass it on to L. Swartz. But if Elle Swartz is not here. Oh, she's here. I'm here. Okay, great. Excellent. <laughs> I am here, and um, I'm going to read fast, but the, my only introduction is I'm blaming this on um, Bitch Muse. It's Bitch Muse's fault. Something is wrong with my penis. My penis is the wrong color. I don't know exactly what color my penis is, but it's not the right color. My penis is too small unless it's too big, so I apologize. My penis is the wrong length and the wrong width. My penis doesn't behave properly, nor does it perform its duties at the correct time or the appropriate place. My penis is all wrong. I am so sorry about my penis. Worse yet, my penis is not a penis. My penis is a pistol, but it's not really a pistol because it's a crow. Well, it's not a crow exactly. My penis is not a pistol or a crow. It's what is stuck between my teeth after I swallow. Or maybe my penis is a song or it's made of water. Let's be honest, no one has seen my penis, including me, but I'm pretty sure it's fucked up. In fact, the worst part about my penis is I can't find my penis. I seem to have misplaced it. I think it might be because I neglected it. I often carelessly left my penis unleashed and at some point my penis must have got out and now I'm not sure where my penis is. It might never see, I might never see my penis again. I doubt my penis can find its own way home. Now that my penis is lost, I can't put out a bolo for my penis. Look out for what exactly? I don't know how my penis looks. I can't describe it. If my penis has a name it will come to, if called, I don't know what that is. So will anyone know which particular lost penis is mine? How will a kind stranger bring my lost penis home if they happen to find it? A sad lost penis wandering alone. 
I really should have taken better care of my penis. I should have watched YouTube tutorials on the proper maintenance for my particular model of penis. I should have made sure the lube never dried out or got sticky or ran low. I should have fed my penis treats. I should have bought my penis outfits. I should have bought my penis that scooter it hinted it wanted. I should have enrolled my penis in self-defense classes just in case. Instead, all I ever did was take my penis for granted. All I ever did was criticize its size and shape and color. I always told my penis all the things I thought it did wrong. I wished it would disappear, and then it did. Now I don't remember what it was like to have a penis, when or if I had one. I just know what it's like to have a missing penis. It's sad. It's almost unbearable. I suffer from the penis-shaped hole in my life. Please come home to me, my penis. I'll do better. I'll praise your undercooked coloring and your <clears throat> bends and twists, and I'll pet you nicely just as you like it. Contrary to everything I said before, there's nothing wrong with you. There's only something wrong with me. Come home, buddy, please. <laughs> Well, that poor sucker working at the lost and found department. <laughs> oh, shit, I had to mute myself. I'm so sorry. <sighs> okay. There must be lots of lost penises, actually. Well, there's a detachable penis uh, video, in fact. Um, but that's for later. Um, <laughs> thanks, Elle. Nice to see you pop in here. <laughs> Okay, Christina Stapleton, um, it's, it's your turn. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the days just go by this summer, one right after the other, the same. And um, then I realized that actually my summers went by the same when I was a kid. So I wrote this poem, My Summer Vacation. We dreamed of bikes and swimming at the beach while making heaping piles of withered weeds to rescue bean plants from the strangled field, weeds popping up from clusters of pink seeds. By making heaping piles of withered weeds, each day restores the blankness of the rose. Weeds popping up from clusters of pink seeds return like manna in the night they grow. Each day restores the blankness of the rose. And then again, the weeds invade in waves, return like manna in the night. They grow more like a crop than lettuce, squash, or kale. And then again, the weeds invade in waves, plus raspberries with ever-bearing stems, more like a crop than lettuce, squash, or kale. We ate our fill until we hated them plush raspberries with ever-bearing stems. We plucked them, plucked them, plucked away the days. We ate our fill until we hated them. The garden was our prison, was our cage. We plucked them, plucked them, plucked away the days to rescue bean plants from the strangled field. The garden was our prison, was our cage. We dreamed of bikes and swimming at the beach. All right, Christina, beautiful. Nice to hear your work again. I'm glad you could pop in here. Thank you. Who's next on our open mic? It's Emily Wilson. Emily, are you with us? I'm here, hi. Hi. Hey, can you guys hear me? Hear you fine. Perfect, I'm Emily, I'm new to Washington. So I appreciate you guys letting me hang out with you tonight, it's been wonderful to hear everybody. Where'd you um, move from? In North Carolina. Far out. Yeah, so all oh. the way across the country. Um, thank you, thank you. It's been nice to be here. Um, my chapbook just came out on Friday with Glass Poetry Press. Um, it's entitled Hypochondria, Least Powerful of the Greek Gods, and it uses Greek mythology to explore health anxiety. Um, and the one poem I'm going to share with y'all tonight is entitled Sisyphus tries meditating. 
How is the crushed velvet of my breath supposed to ease the sinking? Breath and breath, and already I am restless. The chirping in my chest I left for so long. Breath and breath, incessant yet empty as an emerald. To facet the air with each exhale, breath and breath, I dream of a necklace an amulet of fresh water pearls strung in place for each damning thing I've ever said to my mother. Her pain pressed to my chest so I can polish it into forgiveness. What is that slow stone roll of thunder I hear? How near the time to wind that boulder back up the hill? My inhales frail as baby's breath and breath. Imagine them a bouquet I could send my sister, a note. I have thought kindly of you. Aren't you feeling better now in today's cross-stitched blue? All my thoughts caught, an announcement of Jasper and Emerald Parade, breath and breath. I want more confidence, not for myself, but to be less of a field mine for those who cross through the swamp fog of my fears, breath and breath and back to the velvet. I wish my name too were a word that sounded like what it meant, soft, crushed, playing with the light. Thank you. Bravo, Emily. Thank you. Thanks for being part of this community and welcome to Cascadia. Far out. Okay. Hey, speaking of Cascadia, we go to, you know, you, you think it might be Northern Cascadia, but it's more like Central in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. But uh, Carla Stein is active um, with the word storm group there and my friend Rob Lewis was the feature um, a month or so ago and the work at the open mic was really strong so Carla Stein if you're still here it's your time maybe tell us take a couple of seconds to tell us about word storm and then give us three minutes of your best sure thank you Paul it's it's really great to to be able to share with all of you guys tonight uh, and uh, hear what's, what's going on uh, south of the, the 49th parallel. So, yeah, um, uh, I originally hail from Chicago, um, not too far from the same neighborhood that, that Paul does. So it, it's, it's nice to connect with uh, um, what's happening down in the States again as well. Um, Wordstorm um, is a, uh, a small uh, literary organization that um, basically um, tries to promote um, artists uh, here on Vancouver Island, but we also try to, uh, to bring people in from wherever we can um, because it's you know, good to share from wherever. Um, so Paul has been up here doing workshops uh, and uh, because we have Zoom uh, and we don't have a lot of money, we were able to bring Rob up um, about a month ago um, and we're hoping to, uh, we, we do a monthly open mic um, at this point um, online, and uh, we're going to be continuing that as of September. So if anyone's interested in participating, um, just uh, put something in the chat, um, send me your email, and I'm happy to get in touch with you if you'd like to participate in what's going on up this way. And it'd be great if you put the link in the chat when you finish reading your poem. Will do. Excellent. Um, my poem for tonight uh, comes from after watching, well, just a little proviso on that, we, we're not supposed to hug each other anymore. Um, and so um, I was taking a course uh, not too long ago uh, and uh, the instructor suggested that we watch a, a video on YouTube from 2006 that was done in, in, uh, in Australia where someone decided to just stand around and with a, a sign saying free hugs and, and uh, this sort of inspired that, that, that video inspired this poem. And the poem sort of, uh, it's an erasure poem. And it came out of, I don't know why, but after watching the video, um, the phrase came to mind for me, what is the price of freedom? And so I Googled um, quotes about what is the price of freedom and then did an erasure poem um, from those quotes. And so here goes, free hugs not to ask anything in return. Together, a bargain, not for themselves. Utter recklessness, the price. Unobstructed breath of life. People take the timid burden. 
temporary safety, eternal vigilance, fatigue of resistance, an artist's mind, enemy of conformity, being bold, giving such freedom, dreams, love. Thanks, Carla. Thanks for all you do, and thanks for that poem. All right, next up, Michael Dillon Welch. Speaking of people who run readings, here's another one. Michael, I apologize for privately chat in the chat, sending you a private chat message that included a link to the video of detachable penis. That was for everybody and not just for you. It was meant for everyone, I think. Uh, you can still send it. Uh, so yeah, I uh, um, run the Soul Food Poetry Night. That's the third Thursday of every month. And we've just restarted uh, with Zoom readings. And I also uh, uh, help run the Redmond Association of Spoken Word. And our readings are the last Friday of every, every month. So we do have a reading this Friday. If you go to raspread.com, you can find the information there. And we'd be happy to welcome all folks from everywhere. Okay, two poems. Um, these are both uh, from my uh, year-long commitment to write at least one new poem every day. And haiku don't count. This is Smoke. I once fired a gun for love. More than once. I riddled the paper torso with black round holes, brought it home from the range as a souvenir of an evening spent with my girlfriend, whose dad was a cop. For protection, she said, of her gun in the nightstand. One weekend, I went to her place late using my key. And fearing she wasn't expecting me, I called her name in the dark from the living room hallway from the threshold to her bedroom. She didn't wake, and if I had been an intruder, her gun would have been no protection at all. We broke up on a night of jasmine stars. The second poem. This is called Within. If I were to write like Mary Oliver, I'd be better off if I moved off the grid near a marsh with muskrats, a stream or two, gentle hills, a woods that went on and on farther than I could walk, snags with woodpecker holes, the trills of goldfinches that I'd come to know individually, worlds in my palm, fish up from a pond, the weather above, never a metaphor for internal struggle. I'd accept nature's invitations, learn to pay attention, feel the rhythm of the bees and bear grass, and the bears too. I'd learn the poem that writes itself in the wind before any pen presses paper. The poem I need to go without find within. All right, Michael, thanks, man. Thanks for being here tonight. Peter Munro. Have you unmuted yourself, Peter? I believe I have. Would you like to read a poem to us? Sure. First, Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. This has really been, it's been months since we've seen each other and it's really been a delight. So thank you very much. This is called The Wind's Measure. The length of the wind runs from mid-May to murder. The length of the wind runs from January through joy. The, the wind runs as long as the right hand's first finger points to the sun after thunder. The wind gallops prayer word like a horse held in the palm of a rock, no taller than a knee bent for the sake of singing. The wind weighs more than the fossilized horse and stretches from fingernail to praise. The length of the wind runs from mid-May to mercy, January through justice, unto the broken, 
dwelling in a broken promised land the wind drops a hammer and some are warmed and some are chilled and some laugh and some die silently through the nuclear physicist the wind wicks loud as paper scraps trailing in the wind's wake igniting an empiricist fragrant through tallow the wind strikes the wind like rice in a paddy the wind scatters petals like blossoms of napalm. The wind snaps the backs of malnourished conquistadors bowed down to gold. It is the wind who estimates poverty in moments by the method of moments, who assesses want in units of a mass. It is the wind who shakes America by the ovaries, runs the length of revolution, all the calories in a dollar. The length of the wind runs from mid-March to hunger. The length of the wind grunts from Saturday through sorrow. The wind flutters nothing but orgasms and afterplay. The wind numbers seminarians more numinous than semen. The wind is a moat on the wind. The wind is the dust that measures time in footsteps. The wind is the word in the throat of the dust. The length of the wind runs from midwife to marvel. The wind ribbons out within mid-May and morning, and dust is the voice. The wind quickers glory. The wind quickers grief. Thanks, brother. Thanks for getting us all together. Thanks for being here. Jim O'Halloran, would you kindly give us a meditation to close our evening and let us get into the after chat or whatever whatever we want to call it after hang the after hang or whatever? I will do that. This is a tune called Earth Jones, which Dave Liebman wrote for Elvin Jones. And uh, today it's for Steve Grossman, who has replaced Wayne Shorter and Miles Davis band. And Steve Grossman died 11 days ago. Mm. So Earth Jones.
Jim, nice work, man. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to uh, Peter Monroe and Mark Johnson and T. Clear. Thank you to our featured poet, Teresa yeah. from Ukiah, California. Can we have another hand for Teresa? Yay. Hello. Thank you all to all the open mic people for Poets and Writers' uh, support of this event. And uh, soon we will be in touch via the Easy Speak website about future such events probably in the regular Monday night slot, maybe once a month, maybe twice. We don't know yet, but uh, we appreciate your, um, appreciate your help for this and your support Thank of this you. and your being here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to all of you that put this together. Yes. Wonderful. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. See you next time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, next time. So, and that was great. <laughs>